Prepare to be modelized. I touch up on her facial sculpting. Chinese eyes, Indian hair, black girl. But you big African asshole. Negro ear and the Negro nose. And the Negro eye and the Negro foot. So you have myths of this Oriental woman. Do you love me? T.J., I'm here today to speak for all people of mixed race in America. An Arab father and a black African mother. He's in the next room. Room tone. Room tonic. Am I in the light? I'm feeling wet. Just liquid, just liquefaction. Subcutaneous, sebum, these glands. Hormones is wildin'. Heavens to Murgatroyd. Once again, it is I, your black snagglebus with the dewy skin, here to introduce to you a children's cartoon, which will have nothing to do with the main topic. Totally Spies is more or less a cartoon version of Charlie's Angels. In it, Clover, Sam, and the ethnically unassigned Alex commit acts of fabulous espionage on behalf of an as yet unnamed Anglophone nation. Hello, ladies. For what it lacks in Lucy Liu, it makes up in jewel tone bodysuits. <gasps> but there is audience overlap, women, young girls, and at least one boy who will within the decade discover his love for skin tight synthetics. You. <laughs> Origin stories aside, one episode, Model Citizens, opens on three fashion models on set of a photo shoot. Striking their most dramatic poses, they show off their silk sateen two pieces in some of my favorite colors. Caucasoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, Oop, Turquoise, Fuchsia, Chartreuse. It's all very Benetton. <laughs> then suddenly, as if from nowhere, the Mediterranean sun is obscured, a whirlwind of foliage surrounds the women, and a helicopter unceremoniously abducts our three models, leaving nothing but a scene in ruin. A barren temple, broken columns, a crumbling architrave. Repeat viewers of this channel know exactly where this is going. Such disappearances are happening worldwide, and our three neoprene queens are tasked to investigate. During their briefing, they are instructed to infiltrate New York Fashion Week and find justice for the missing women. The briefing is presented by their handler, Jerry, a fantastic fop who finds increasingly camp ways to abduct our trio before regaling them with wacky gadgets to aid in their mission. My name is Sydney Bristow. Now I'll admit, I like to look too deep into things that simply don't provoke scrutiny, but this episode has a chilling scene. After giving the girls a runway they'll never forget, international supermodel Gazelle retires to her trailer, removes her ivory-trimmed hot pink opera gloves to reveal below the shoulder at every joint a new finger, forearm, palm, belonging to someone else. And you probably didn't know, Marjorie, that Suzanne was not just any Miss Georgia. She was every Miss Georgia. Apparently, it's run by an ex-model named Tuesday Tate. The responsible parties revealed to be a mad scientist and disgruntled has-been, intent on designing the perfect woman. I want to create an army of perfect models so that I can dominate the industry that destroyed my career. To assemble the perfect fashion body from the parts of different fashion models. Models who have, presumably, been gruesomely butchered. <gasps> I'm too young to die! According to The New Yorker, we live in the age of Instagram face, where filters and surgically enhanced faces wreak havoc on the minds of users. Basically, the most flawless versions of ourselves according to Instagram's filtered system. Users who are driven under the knife. Honey, you're never too thin and you're never too young. To regain their confidence. Plump her lips. Increase their viewership. Chop her noses. And crucially, appeal to advertisers. Porcelain looking skin. With all the innocence of artificial intelligence, one stylist describes the face as follows. We're talking an overly tan skin tone, a South Asian influence with the brows and eye shape, an African-American influence with the lips, a Caucasian influence with the nose, a cheek structure that is predominantly Native American and Middle Eastern. Now, I'm not sure how something is simultaneously, specifically Native American and Middle Eastern, or for that matter, African-American and somehow not African. Maybe it's what happens when you mix that Negro with that Creole. But it seems to be a racial issue. And while we're on the subject of beauty and butchery, in 2012, at New York Fashion Week no less, Dolce & Gabbana accessorized some of their models with earrings in Italian maiolica, a popular style of 16th century colored ceramics. They caused quite the stir. These were the earrings in question. The fuck is that? Accepting the visible Frankenstein stitches, Totally Spies may have totally anticipated this moment by some 20 years. Turns out, looking too deeply can yield surprising results. Despite Gazelle and her hand of many colors, 
we shouldn't look to a children's show to expose the violence of the beauty industry. That would make Halle Berry's Catwoman redundant. Cat got your time. Despite the beheaded black amours dangling from the ears of Fashion Week, time to accessorize. We shouldn't jump to conclusions about Sicilian Negro heirlooms. And despite all that's been said of Instagram face, it takes someone like Kylie Jenner to make big lips a thing. We shouldn't use people's personal surgical decisions as objects for political criticism. When black girls have been walking around with big lips forever. And yet, politics lingers in the air. So, let's get into the 19th century. The debate about polychromy had started in 1815 when architectural theorist Quatremer de Quincy published a book dedicated to Olympian Zeus in the full glory of colors. 1851, Hyde Park, London, the Crystal Palace, at the great exhibition of works of industry of all nations. What began between England and France as a colonial cockmeasuring contest became the World's Fair. Now, it's no fashion week, but for more than a century, people of all walks of life came together to behold the marvels of art and industry, some of them in cages. International expositions promoting art, industry, and local resources from the various colonial empires. Last time we were here, we explored the reaction to John Gibson's Tinted Venus. This polychrome sculpture too caused controversy, partially because she was colored and Honey, because pussy is pink, baby. Despite her classical subject matter and surrounding columns, Gibson's polychrome was panned in the press. Asserting the use of polychromy in Greek architecture and sculpture was very much against the aesthetics of neoclassicism. For the neoclassical critics heading the academies, sculpture should be pure marble, ideally white and appealing to the mind. It is white. It is a intellectual beauty. Color introduced a needless realism. It was a decorative property appealing to the senses. Not a beauty which derives from gaudy, happy colors and ornaments. And for some viewers, this sensual appeal resulted in sexual arousal. Get into it. But the gag is... The gag is that the sobering, neutering power of white marble was just wishful thinking. We think of Victorian culture as very conservative and reserved. Marble's uniform whiteness was said to give chaste permission to view the otherwise immodest nudes. But nude slave women in sculpture and decorative arts were accepted. Which is to say that white marble had men creaming their breeches the entire time. Because the man that is living to ejaculate, he's in a predator mode. But there's more to sculpture's polychrome problem. Recall from the last video, James Jackson Jarvis's criticism of colored sculpture, that we look to sculpture for form alone, and that the intellectual pleasure diminishes to the degree that pure white is departed from in its material. Clearly implicating Gibson's Venus, Nathaniel Hawthorne decries that same sculpture as looking to have been stained with tobacco juice. Edward Hale, one of the rare celebrants of tinted Venus, describes her as follows. Exquisite, alive, warm, ruddy. Put a pin in that last one. Well, time to pull that pin out. Bad attitudes, octoroon skin tones. Edward Hale's praise is laden with a little 19th century race baiting. Ruddy was often deployed to describe the skin tone of mixed race people, notably octoroons, semantically speaking, one eighth black. Phonetically speaking, one of the better racial epithets. <laughs> so maybe the issue with color and sculpture wasn't just a disgust for fleshy nude, but a disgust for colored flesh. And funny thing about tobacco, it isn't pink. So what are the girls getting into? Gucci, Prada, elegance, fashion, pure white, pure white, pure white couches, limos, fashion. Welcome to Dreptomania, where I scream into the microphone. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Draytomania, where I make my way, unguided and uninformed, through art history, visual culture, and critical theory. In the last video, we discussed the erotic power of Tinted Venus, pure white sculpture, and Tyra Banks. In the meantime, some larger creators came across my videos and graciously shared them, and I now have nearly a thousand subscribers. So shout out to Leftist Cooks and everyone at FE Algorithm, and I'm once again asking you to like, comment, subscribe, donate to my Patreon, and help me become yet another wealthy, famous YouTuber. Dollar signs wait. If you kindly or cruelly leave a comment about what you liked and what you didn't like, that would help all of us. And never forget, you can share a link. When we try to recreate the beautiful face that we see on TV, it's all about these contours. Today, we return to the Crystal Palace and the arguments against colored sculpture, using Charmaine A. Nelson's work, The Color of Stone, as our guide. That chiseled, defined look. We'll see how race, racial purification, taste, elegance, and miscegenation played upon 19th century sculpture. What the hell is Chinese? How the art world was shaken by the twin powers of anthropology and interior design. 
pure white couches. And, if I can, how a series of anti-Arab revenge fantasies contributed to this, this, and this. White husband watches his wife get rammed by a large black man. If all goes well, and I can avoid burnout, next time we'll return to the Crystal Palace for the last time to see what all these feelings meant for sculpting black women in America. This is my longest script so far, and what proceeds will contain lots of knots, threads, and twisted mysteries, like a gay racist macrame. Wait, did I already say fashion? So bear with me, because it's a lot. It's almost too much. These gays, they're trying to murder me. Get into it. Issues around race, sexuality, and gender are all reflected by images of the female body. In the last video, I introduced James Jackson Jarvis's quote about color diminishing the intellectual pleasure of sculpture. Now, it would've been fine if he just said that, but he elaborates, I only gave you the first half, here's the rest. Does anyone find other pleasure in the artistic freaks of the classical ages and the imitations of the Renaissance in the shape of black amours, draperies, and occasionally separate features rendered by the natural colors of their stone material than in the ingenuity of these combinations? Now where the fuck did black amours come from? I beg your pardon? I beg your pardon? Well, John Gibson wasn't the only artist at the 1851 Expo. By that time, Second Empire France had become the leading nation in bronze work and earned themselves a dedicated section. In that section were two busts by Charles Cordier, who would become one of the most celebrated artists working in material polychromy. Cordier used every possible way of giving color to his sculpture. Combining colored marble, bronze patinas, and the occasional enamel, Cordier's work found favor at the highest social level, including Napoleon III and Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria purchased those two bronzes. These were the bronzes in question. The African Venus and Saeed Abdallah or Saeed and Kess. For the rest of the video, I'll refer to this sculpture as Saeed, but at the 1851 Expo, it was titled Negro from Timbuktu. It is the first sculpture Cordier ever sold. Such busts were a mainstay in Cordier's career, which coincided with the second successful attempt at ending slavery in France and its colony. This time it stuck. At age 21, his first submission to the Paris Salon was a plaster bust of Saeed, who was a freed slave from Darfur. Works like this landed him an 1856 government assignment to Algeria. He was introduced to Onyx Marble on his 1856 ethnographic mission. To study African physical types. In short, to render with analytical detail the African facial anatomy. He also tried several times to represent his foreign models with materials from their own country. Adding a little colonial flair, he sculpted these busts using stones from a recently rediscovered Algerian quarry. Here, the Greek woman is made of Greek marble. This association between subject and material resource is a subtlety anticipating Kara Walker by more than a century. Something called a sugar subtlety. I love this term. A subtlety is a sugar sculpture sculpted to portray and only could be consumed by royalty, nobility. According to Charmaine Nelson, Jarvis's fervent dismissal of polychromy would most certainly have been predicated on his knowledge of the work of the French sculptor Charles Henri Joseph Cordier. Well, that certainly seems to solve our black and white problem. Now, what about these artistic freaks? Hey, what is with these head things? We keep seeing them everywhere. Testa di moro. Now, I may be getting my dates a little bit wrong, but since about the 9th century, let's say, the Christian Mediterranean was eaten up piecemeal by the Moors. The players wear shoes called Mori Gators. The word Mori is a variation of the word Moorish. All that is our stuff. That's African stuff. Bitch! <laughs> it's an out of date, ethnologically dubious term referring to sometimes Africans, sometimes Arabs, sometimes Muslims. Think of it as race before race science. Who is Beethoven? Beethoven was Thoven Bay. He was a Moor. <laughs> <laughs> Why would she say that? Like Subsequently, a number of Christian European nations created myths of breaking free from or avoiding Moorish occupation. Spain had the La Conquista, France the Battle of Poitiers, Sardinia had its four Moors, and Greece, along with like 80% of the Balkans, the Ottomans. In Sicily's case, there's the Testa di Mori, or the Testa di Moro, I forget how to pluralize it, but basically it translates to the heads of Moors, the Moorhead, Agnes. Oh, are you referring to me? In Italy's case, the story, as is oft repeated, is that a young Saracen seduced a Sicilian woman, had a long-standing affair, and sometime after reveals he must leave her and return to his family. Single, he told me. Single my ass. Naturally, she decapitates him. In an act of pre-modern melancholia, she repurposes his severed head as a flower pot and cultivates a lush, fragrant basil plant. Better Homes and Gardens presents Othello. 
That was cute, right? Y'all thought that was cute? Patreon.com slash Dreadtomania. It's a warning to husbands, babe. Screw around and you'll end up buried in the garden. Now again, the dates may be somewhat off, but since, let's say, the 17th century, these severed heads have been reproduced in the aforementioned Maiolica. Now this style of enameled pottery was cultivated on the Spanish island of Mallorca during its Moorish occupation. Three guesses as to how I ended up in Sicily. A Moor came here a long time ago and seduced a local girl. This macabre floral origin story has become, like Henry VIII or the guillotine, a bit of tourist-oriented historical kitsch. Nostre teste di moro. Mm -hmm. At this point, some of the vases are women. Some of the vases are white. <gasps> wow. And it is these vases that gave us Fashion Week's racial brouhaha. And I'm at least 50% sure these are the Renaissance imitations Jarvis is mentioning. It could be another kind of sculpture, but it's basically the same story with a different country. You can see these vases strewn about the mise-en-scene in my favorite camp classic. Suddenly, last summer. So while I can agree it's not blackface proper, it's not nothing. And any story can lose its initial political resonances and gain new ones. After all, Jarvis uses this freakish Renaissance rhetoric to criticize Cordier's polygamy. Though, looking at them side by side, they look nothing alike. That's suspicious. So what is he really getting into? That's weird. Cordier moved to Paris and attended the Petite École, opposed to the Grande École, which was the École des Beaux-Arts. The Petite École was training craftsmen, not artists. Oh! Ah, the ghetto! The ghetto! The ghetto! Now, before I go ahead and accuse yet another white man of being a racist, let's look at the historical context to see what else this might be about. Large paintings were supposed to be historical, heroic. This is a painting of everyday life, and according to the rules of the Academy, it had no business being on a canvas this large. The public art shows of the 18th century introduced significant changes to the art world. Jacques-Louis David's Oath of the Horatians, made in 1784, it was absolutely new. Nobody had ever seen anything like it. Changes that threatened the purity of taste established by the ruling classes meaning the reign of noble simplicity and quiet grandeur achieved by the ideal beauty of white marble. Changes which, come the 19th century, would only escalate. In the late 19th century, British sculptors began to move away from the whiteness of neoclassical marble. For artists formerly dependent upon a select group of patrons, public exhibitions provided new ways to gain notoriety. And this painting stole the show. For audiences, they provided new contexts to experience art. The Revolution of 1848 ended the monarchy and ushered in the Second Republic. We see artists turning to figures of laborers, of workers, and showing them in an ennobled and heroic manner. Prior to this, access to and judgment of the arts was considered the purview of a disinterested and enlightened spectator. This was most frequently imagined as a young bachelor who would hone his taste during his European Grand Tour. The Grand Tour was a kind of gap year for the rich and landed. He and other macaroni men would see the sights and sample the brothels of cities across the continent. An educational holiday for those Rococo travelers who could afford it. The lesser classes were expected to treat art, wherever they encountered it, as objects of either devotion or instruction. New shows brought new people into the galleries. In fact, the salon had to stay open longer than it had originally been scheduled just to accommodate the numbers of people that wanted to see it. And the disinterested spectator was forced to contend with plebeian sentimentalism. The virtues of the countryside. Let's get the fuck out of this country, motherfucker. For art academies, new subjects, new techniques, and new audiences meant they would have to either change or lose a controlling interest in good taste. It had no business being on a canvas this large. And good taste was the neoclassical battleground. She said that those shoes were meant to be worn on a beautiful woman. So if that's the case, she should have put them back on the rack because she was unqualified to own those shoes if that's the case. Good art was supposed to uplift the spirit. It appealed to the intellect, not the emotions, and definitely not the body. So if you come up in the studio and start crying in front of a dying General Wolf, we're going to have a problem. So much a problem that the British Royal Academy inscribed above the door of its main display room the following Greek phrase, let no stranger to the muses enter. So much a problem that that same Royal Academy charged admission to its first show. Their justification was that it was the only way to prevent the room from being filled by improper persons to the entire exclusion of those for whom the exhibition is apparently intended. Which, taken together, basically translates to Bro, bitch is so crusty, disgust me. So, for context, the purity of aesthetic taste was being threatened by the presence of peasants, weeping in wonder at public shows, peasants passing judgment and rubbing shoulders with the upper crust. Yes! Couple 
wet wipes case a bum try to touch me. Ew. Ew. So when the 19th century rolled around and its great exhibitions brought fine art into the same context as the marvels of industry, the problem of mixing populations only intensified. And when this painting was shown in the salon in 1857, it was criticized because something about them was frightening to the Parisian populace. And in this way, Cordier presented a problem. Destroying the basis on which sculpture had been taught and made for decades was not going to happen without questioning. Despite his success in England, his early polychromes, Negro and Negress, were not well received in Paris. His 1863 busts, Chinese Man and Chinese Woman, were accused of bringing bad taste to the salon. They were accused of being products of industry under the disguise of art. Polychromy was accused of appealing too much to the body. The 1863 salon polychromes, with their shining surfaces and decorative elements, would be considered distractions from pure form. Jarvis claims that the only pleasure derived from these polychromes comes from the novelty of such combinations. Buildings and interior decorations would admit color. Now, French Second Empire interiors already made liberal use of colored marble. Onyx marble was used for vases, planters. Which only gave Cordier's detractors ammunition on grounds of frivolity. It's something that we always find in decorative art. So when color was added, it became controversial. In the Negro and Negress, you can see very specifically Jarvis's black amours, draperies, and occasionally separate features rendered by the natural colors of the stone material. The intellectual pleasure derived from white marble clearly did not extend to such freakish combinations. The skin on her arms and hands, it's all sorts of different colors. Cordier's work was treated either as trivial in its association with the decorative arts. Instead of using it for jewels, decorative arts, he used it for sculpture pieces. Or threatening in its debasing of the morality of white marble. We have the development of this connection between whiteness, purity, nobility, and an association of those things specifically with Western culture. Labeling polychromy as cheap distractions, gaudy colors and ornaments, secured the refinement of white sculpture. Intellectual beauty. Just as excluding the lower classes, the ghetto, secured the existence of good taste. And it has a white refrigerator. I was like, oh, oh, not a white refrigerator. Girl, please put your shoes on. Let's go find you a home, honey. Ooh. So in part, Jarvis's curious comparison aligns Cordier's work less with pure art and more with exaggerated, out-of-date decorations. The skin of this bust was in oxidized silver. But of all the frivolous decorations, of all the unenlightened spectacle available to anyone in the 19th century, why would you bring up blackamoors? So now why am I in it? Clearly, the girls are concerned with something else. This technique was used by Cordier in order to best represent the specific dark color of African skin. And the rapper claims his use of autotune led to a confrontation with Usher. He sounded real concerned. He was like, man, you kind of kind of fed up music. The value of art was in its psychological effect on the spirit of the viewer. The virtue of simplicity over the indulgence of the Rococo style. If the viewer had proper training. Exactly what the Enlightenment philosophers were calling for artists to do. Otherwise, it was casting pearls before swine. She just doesn't have the vernacular that she thinks she possesses. The whiteness of marble, producing so pure and celestial a light, was healthy for the spirit. The pussy pink realism of colored marble was a cheap imitation of flesh. But the problem of polychrome extended beyond a few underclass interlopers. Another part of art's value derived from the spirit that was imbued into the work. A spirit that was being rapidly eroded by newfangled techniques and new technologies. Similar to the way that we are anxious about technological change, they were anxious about the technological change and social change that went with it in the 19th century. Like many 19th century sculptors and contemporary plastic surgeons, American artist Joel T. Hart was obsessed with building the perfect proportions. Red touch up on her facial sculpting, the strong cheek, the strong jaw, and the strong chin. Even going as far as inventing a pointing machine that assisted sculptors in transferring proportions precisely from model to marble. These are the characteristics of any beautiful face in Hollywood. And Hart was no dummy. In his patent, he made sure to mention its other industrial uses. And that's where he fucked up. So you can't just put that same look on everybody. Ever the hater, James Jackson Jarvis had choice words for Hart. But he makes a fatal mistake to the dignity of his art in also reducing it to a system of external measurements, believing, as he undoubtedly does, that beauty, expression, and character can all be reproduced in material through the agency of a machine. There's a whiff of technophobia in Jarvis's complaint, a technophobia which will soon be applied to photography and is already being applied to AI. I'm about to try the Instagram filter called Asian Beauty. 
Jarvis complains that, in obsessing over new instruments, artists like Joel T. Hart are mistakenly focusing on technical execution. This happens at the expense of things like expression and individual character. Similar language has been deployed against Instagram face. Almost every day we have people coming in and they bring in these screenshots of celebrities of social media influencers and they say, look, we want to look like this. That rather than enhancing individual features, someone can simply take a photo of a celebrity. When you look at Hollywood beautiful celebrities and models. Pop into a surgeon's office. But one thing that's consistent is the out, in, out contour. And leave looking like everyone else. When they should have got the advice to look at your overall features and what's going to work with your individual features, your individual characteristics. But Joel Hart wasn't the only artist making technical interventions. John Gibson devised his polychrome technique for mixing hot wax and paint. And Cordier did more than just mix marbles. He assembled marbles of different colors, played with colored patinas. He used enamels. His bronzes included both natural and artificial patinas. He also employed the new process of metal plating known as galvanoplasty. Bronze was first silvered, most likely with an electrolytic silver plate. Galvanism is the archaic term for conducting electricity. Considering the prevailing taste for hand-hammered bronzes, this electroplating also caused controversy. Accused of being products of industry. Perhaps unrelated, that same galvanism is what gave life to the soulless monster of Victor Frankenstein. Prepare to be modelized. By the power and force of lightning, make our monster grow! Now, Jarvis maintains that sculpture should be appreciated for its form alone. Only white marble, or gilt bronze, or gold can raise a figure out of the muck of reality and into the realm of art. In a second step, this silvered layer would deliberately be oxidized or darkened. You would think that such conditions would be satisfied by any stone in its natural state. After all, some marble simply comes colored. The aim was also very different, as Cordy used it in a naturalistic way to render the specific rich color of the African skin. But Jarvis's issue was about uniform purity. He was against mixing the material, mixing the material in a way that happens to highlight the occasionally separate features rendered in their natural colors. Ew, Interesting too that in the industrial age, advancements in the mechanical and material sciences could diminish the value of art. But Jarvis ensures that we avoid such a lapse in aesthetic judgment. Taking a shot at the new 19th century sciences and dragging Joel Hart to hell, Jarvis continues, This is but another development in the common error of the age, by which mere science is made paramount to spirit, and all phenomena of the soul resolvable into her laws. It's cause you on that damn phone. Uh, we found that the more people look at uh, idealized images or photoshopped images on social media, the worse they tend to feel about their body image. But despite all that Jarvis desires, the Great Exhibition wasn't just any art show. It was the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations and Associated Colonies and sometimes France. Which is to say, it had specific scientific international aspects. And what is more scientific, more international than anthropology? The second factor putting Cordier aside is his dedication to ethnographic sculpture. As changes in art audiences threaten purity of taste, and changes in industry threaten purity of purpose, changes in science threaten the purity of aesthetic experience. Unlike the supposedly strict aesthetic pursuits of neoclassical sculpture, the sculptures of artists ethnographers functioned in the 19th century like the ethnographic photographs that were soon to replace them. We've already seen polychrome sculpture roped into the debates around sexuality, morality, and taste. Whiteness, purity, nobility. But it also played a pivotal part in the developing discourses on class, intellect, and race. During the 19th century, there were lots of public lectures on the races of man. Science was, because it was new, was something people were avidly interested in. It was expected to reveal all the mysteries of the universe. The burgeoning race sciences, part anthropology, part biology, all bullshit needed first to establish its basic categories. Caucasoid, mongoloid, negroid. In that order. And you could tell by the oid on the end that it was scientific. <laughs> Arriving at these three fundamental fantasies was a lengthy process. Searching for a biological basis to race. For 200 years, scientists poked and prodded. This process largely consisted of identifying anatomical features and separating them into different categories. Measured and mapped the human body. Categories often ranked by one or another criterion. 
eye shape, hair form, even brain color. Criteria which frequently place white people at the top. Lo and behold, he discovers that white American males are the smartest people on earth. Other races with blacks always on the bottom. And at the top of cultural production was sculpture. Anatomists and medical illustrators began to use white statues in order to show the ideal bodies to be achieved. Together, these two disciplines validated the extraction of land, labor, and capital from darker, read uglier, continents. Not destroying Indians just for the love of it. They're not enslaving blacks because they're selfish. That this is part of some great inevitability of science. Now, if you're gonna prove who has the best bodies and the best brains, you're gonna need some evidence. A Philadelphia physician, Morton had written two influential books documenting what he claimed were innate differences among humans. Outside of collecting dismembered human body parts, and there was a lot of that, Morton owned the world's largest collection of human skulls. Scientists and hobbyists alike needed visual specimens. Enter Charles Cordier. His purpose as an artist was found. Who would provide with scientific exactitude. In order to best represent the specific dark color of African skin. Though, as we have seen, such exactitude made them hard to receive as art. According to Nelson, they stood for objective representations of bodies that were consumed as scientific evidence of the racial difference and inferiority of other cultures and peoples, and thus supported Europe's colonization of other continents. As an artist and ethnographer, Cordier occupied a complicated position in this disciplinary constellation. He would dedicate his art to representing mankind in the variety of its beauty. He explicitly acknowledges this in his unpublished memoirs, stating that my art incorporated the reality of a whole new subject, the revolt against slavery and the birth of anthropology. A closer look at the context surrounding his work reveals the complex relationship between artist and industry. It all started when he met a former slave turned model, Said Enkes. Both the African Venus and Said Abdullah were modeled on freed slaves living in Paris, though this is not readily apparent given their presentation. Their clothing doesn't scream Second Empire fashion, and their titles too are nonspecific. Changing with their galleries, the bust of Said was once labeled Said and Kess from the Mayok tribe in the Kingdom of Darfur, and recall that in 1851 it was titled Negro from Timbuktu. Here's Timbuktu, here's Darfur. Geographical negligence aside, their titles tell us that these subjects are not of the West. Separate from being sculpted by Cordier, Said had quite the presence in French anthropological circles. Testifying to sculpture's general worth to race science, in 1847, the French Ethnological Society enthusiastically made a bust of Said's face cast in plaster. At the time, he was considered a splendid type, which is basically 19th century for What a beautiful chocolate man! <laughs> Now, Cordier probably never worked in casts, and he presented his own bust of Said at the Paris Salon the next year. He modeled his bust and exhibited it at the Salon in 1848. It is the first sculpture that Cordier ever sold. Testifying to Cordier's particular worth to the field, he would go on to present a series of lectures to the Ethnological Society in 1862. Cordier was also a proud abolitionist. He sculpted these works and said that they were in celebration of the abolition of slavery. We've already established that his work lacks a certain caricature of other racial representations. African Venus is really interesting because her face and her hair are very natural. His sculptures, such as the miniature, Love One Another, espouse a kind of racial harmony, and he described his work as sharing beauty in all types. It's all very Benetton. But institutions of race science were uninterested in the sculptor's personal politics. They became symbolic of the freedom. Though they were very interested in his sculptures. The scientific question of the day, are all people, no matter their physical features, members of the same or different species? The developing race sciences can be split into two camps, the monogenesists and the polygenesists. They differed in how they explained human variation. It's a debate between people who look at the book of Genesis and see what they call a single creation, God created Adam and Eve, and scientists who say, well, actually, these races couldn't possibly have come from the same place. There must be different and separate creations. Working from a largely religious outlook, monogenesists held that all humans sprang from Adam and Eve, and that different groups had therefrom degenerated. Those who remained neutral in the battle were cursed to be born with black skin. This is the Mormon explanation for the Negro race. Unsurprisingly, black people were considered the most far gone. You may have heard the phrase children of Ham, describing how we were cursed with black skin for the sin of gazing upon Noah's beige nakedness. I know black, I know black, I know black. 
Impossible. I know black. Some monogenicists did away with religion entirely and conceded that humans evolved from animals. In a stunning reversal, white people were considered the most advanced in said evolution. Uh, curiously, some English scholars do the same thing. They discover English men are actually smarter than Americans. And guess what? The French discover that the French are really smarter than both. One relevant monogenicist was Armand de Carafage, anthropology chair at the French Museum of Natural History. He did not support evolution, and his ethnological galleries represented stages of decline. He once claimed that the Spanish have abased their blood and were a race a hundred times mixed. Now where would he get that idea? A Moor came here a long time ago and seduced a local girl. The future for degenerate populations was bleak. No two distinctly marked races can dwell together on equal terms. That same museum awarded Cordier the title of ethnographic sculptor and sent him to Egypt, Algeria, and Greece to create the work that would define his career. You can see here the wide geographical variety of his models. Between 1851 and 1860, Cordier displayed 15 of his busts in those galleries. The busts he brought back were part of the Museum of Natural History in Paris. But Cordier didn't discriminate. He was also a member of the Parisian Anthropological Society, a polygenicist institution. Nations and races, like individuals, have each an especial destiny. Now, polygenicists believe that races had different historical origins, springing forth from the earth like so many Cabbage Patch dolls, and in different stages of development. Some are born to rule, and others to be ruled. Given some colonial incentive, underdeveloped races could achieve civilization. The society's founder, Paul Broca, believed that, like horses and donkeys, race mixing would lead to sterilization within three or four generations, putting the mule in mulatto. Because it's infertile. So from subject matter to display spaces to his presence in scientific societies, we can see all around Cordier a non-aesthetic context for his artwork, a context unconcerned with the purity of marble, but very concerned with the purity of races. What you did not want for your civilization was found in the Blue Hills of Virginia. Unclassifiable, they were called the Wind Tribe for their white, Indian, and Negro ancestry. But Cordier wasn't an innocent abolitionist caught in the racist crossfire. He was an active participant. Working so closely with his human subjects only served to authenticate his findings. Findings which aesthetically and functionally aligned with these dueling ideologies. Oh, hell, I with different races. Aesthetically, his disdain for casting busts was that it interfered with the expressive potential of his subjects. Botox causes a muscle to be paralyzed. Functionally, such casting interfered with the accuracy of depicting pure racial types. It's really important just to know different faces. Typically, Asian girls will have heavier set eyebrows. It's going to be harder to give them a lift. And we know how one critic felt about technical accuracy. It's all about these contours. Remember Jarvis's complaint about machinery and science ruining the spirit of art? He continues, No machine can model an idea or fill a hiatus of the imagination. When we succeed in measuring the soul, then, and not only until then, we may be able to reduce sculpture to mechanical art. Well, scientists were hard at work doing exactly that. The wonders of race science, will they ever cease? Apparently not. How would you feel taking a journey on your DNA? I'm a little bit nervous, I have to say. Oh my god. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no. No. And we go back to the, the um, 23 and Me, Light Skin Queen. <laughs> I might have to cut that, but I'm not. And we cut to the 23 and Me, Light Skin Queen. <laughs> My script is over here. Nazi pseudo-doctors developed a fake science of the study of Jewish skull sizes, skeletons, and especially noses. If we just take African Americans as an example, there's not a single body part that hasn't been subjected to this kind of analysis. You'll find articles in the medical literature about the Negro ear, and the Negro nose, and the Negro leg, and the Negro heart, and the Negro eye, and the Negro foot, and it's every single body part. In the 19th century, race was not only a mishmash of scattered gene expressions, but also a tool to prognosticate on the character of the peoples it invented. Samuel Morton drew wild conclusions based on very careful studying and ranking of these skulls. This was the scope of physiognomy, a subfield of a pseudoscience. With an almost incel-like obsession, physiognomy took calipers to every cleft and crevice of the human skull. 
I'm also gonna mark the mandibular angle, or the jaw angle. A jaw angle for criminality. Facial angle to illustrate the proximity to the primitive. A ratio for moral inclination. Skull size to identify superior or inferior intelligence. The length of the nose, an index for trustworthiness. This is the Happy Merchant, an innocuous name for the latest iteration of an ancient anti-Semitic trope. Each kind of skull to divine a different racial disposition, like crystal balls made of bone. You cannot predict their morality, their behavior, their achievements, potential for achievement. Cordier's work was uniquely useful, citing both his scientific measurement and attention to physiognomic detail. Cordier claims his works as scientific records, but his descriptions of his work tell us just what this science was all about. The springtime bride is starry-eyed. And poets often say, No other bride would dare to dream the dreams that April may. His Arab of Lagoa was purchased by Napoleon III. Could he describe the bust as possessing a privileged nature with a nobility of lines and a harmonious ensemble? This kind maintains the perfection and majesty of its primordial type. That majestic type, according to Cordier, was the noble primordial Caucasian. The summer bride is glorified by Merlin's magic touch. A lucky man receives the love of June, July, and such. His Algerian woman of 1855, then titled Mulatto from Algiers, was drawn from a woman who in this case was half black, half more. Again, there's distinctions. Rip me out the plastic, I've been brand new. In an 1860 catalog, Cordier directs our attention to her bone structure. One sees on her otherwise intelligent forehead the profound reckoning of despotic passions. Otherwise intelligent, save someone's despotic passions. Now, whose despotic passions might that be? Moresque, Moorish, was the word commonly used for Arab. His 1860 catalog abounds with such anecdotes. The winter bride is typified by Christmas frost and fairies, and though the weather's changeable, her virtue never varies. At this point, there are about six different threads running through this essay, so let's check in. Give me a fake name. Fanny Bryce. Fanny Bryce. That's taken. Cordier worked in material polychromy, which was frowned upon by the establishment. Honey, cause pussy is pink, baby. But he benefited from new technologies and new exhibition practices. When color was added, it became controversial, but also became very popular in many ways. His work also served the non-aesthetic purposes of race science. Anatomists and medical illustrators began to use white statues in order to show the ideal bodies to be achieved. Race science classified the facial features of different groups Chinese eyes, Indian hair, black girl, let me pour you a glass. and used those features as indices for civility, proximity to the primitive, brutality, superior or inferior intelligence, and beauty. Look at where you be in, hair weaves like Europeans, fake nails done by Koreans. Classical sculpture exemplified ideal European beauty. White women continued to be likened to a waxen Venus and white men marble Apollos. And despite our changing ideals, like my Negro nose with Jackson, yeah. the cosmetic practice of breaking one's own face bones, especially noses, remains racially coded. <laughs> so, Let's proceed into Cordier's cosmetic interventions. Prepare for trouble. Make it double. Sculpture and race science worked hand in glove, and Cordier was the tailor. His task was to create busts documenting pure racial types, crucially not portraits of individuals, to protect the world from miscegenation, to define the features of every nation, or, as Nelson puts it, in traveling to France's North African colonies, his task was to capture racial types in amalgamated composites of the individuals he encountered, a point confirmed by the ethnic, racial, and cultural generalizations deployed in the seemingly interchangeable titles he attached to his sculptures. But not only the titles were fungible. Groups in the Mediterranean have been mixing for some time, or as one curator put it, abasing their blood. And more came here a long time ago. Colonialism only accelerated this amalgamation. And it ain't even about hating white people because we all have white blood in us. Thank you, slavery, okay? The task of crafting the essential Negro, therefore, required a few tweakments. Okay, let's stop right there. Hey, Nicole, I need you to be blacker. 
Though he insists on his scientific diligence, listen to Cordier describe his method. I examine and compare many individuals. I study the form of their head, the traits of their faces, the expression of their physiognomy. I examine the common characteristics of a race that I wish to represent. I'm also going to mark the mandibular angle. I arrive at an ideal type or rather, the ideal type of their characteristics. Then, I reconstruct an ensemble in which I reunite all the special beauty of a given race, an entire population. When shaping the features of a potential bust, Cordier shuttles between capturing individual peculiarities and idealizing what was most racially representative. They don't then make a caricature of, like, over-sexualized black woman, you know, and then get on stage and be like... Now, let's not make mountains of molehills. Everyone wants to look their best. It takes someone like Kylie Jenner to make big lips a thing. In some cases, that meant looking your most Negroid. Your cornrows on you, you little pickaninny. <laughs> on Bo Derek, a 10. <laughs> and any artistic representation is going to defer from its subject somewhat. So what's a little South Asian influence with the eyes? Foxy eyes. A little African-American lip. Plumper lips. A Caucasian nose. Sharper noses? Well, to paraphrase Cordier, they are the special beauties of entire populations. Eye shape. Chinese eyes. Hair form. Indian hair. Even brain color were scrutinized in the hunt for the fundamental sources of racial difference. In this regard, we should return to Cordier's bust of Saeed to see which minimally invasive adjustments were made. According to Barbara Larson, whether Cordier knew about his model's involvement with the Ethnological Society or not, he seemed to share a concern about Saeed Abdullah's cranium. Edouard Pape notes in the Cordier catalog subtle alterations that the artist made to the young man's physiognomy, primarily with regard to the shape of the nose and the curvature of the forehead. The model was given a more prominent forehead, a signifier of intelligence in 19th century France. Sidebar. Look at that heavy sky out there. Purple. I always thought the phrases highbrow and lowbrow referred to high class and low class culture. Chicken was lowbrow, poultry was highbrow. Birds, fowl. Eating, dining, purple. Boy, what kind of homosexual are you anyway? That's not purple, Mary. That color up there is mauve. Oh. After hearing me drop the phrase in conversation, my professor clarified that they referred to the facial angle, a cranial concept that comes right out of physiognomy. Basically, the higher the forehead, the greater the tendency toward intelligence, innocence, or whatever process deemed inaccessible to Africans. Whereas black bodies were often purposefully associated with simians rather than white statues. So, when Cordier gives his bust a more prominent forehead, he's not simply improving the composition. He's also navigating the aesthetic structures of race science. Up here, if you put Botox in these, it could actually give people more of a Neanderthal look, which... This was the same Saeed that the Ethnological Society considered a splendid type. <laughs> it would seem, then, that not only was sculpture put to use for colonial anthropology... A doctor in Berlin responded to the moment by pioneering the field of rhinoplasty. ...but also that the skull-obsessed tenets of race science were useful for Cordier's sculpture. Most of his clientele were Jewish men and women, hoping to blend in or pass as non-Jewish. What mysteries, then, lie behind the current craze for lip fillers? What are we being killed on the freeway and white folks come by? I'll take those lips. <laughs> So now that we have a handle on race and Cordier's work, let's return to the World's Fair. So this was the general context prevailing when Cordier exhibited his first polychrome busts. Though some critics were loath to recognize polychromy. A general resistance to polychromy among the official circles. They didn't hold a monopoly on public opinion. And a few attempts here and there to introduce it. Indeed, the existence of a public to have an opinion was relatively new. Single shilling exhibitions represented a widening access to the arts, and public access has its own peculiar problems. The man that is living to ejaculate, he's in a predator mode. We've seen the erotic responses to Tinted Venus. Both the academies and the press decried her tasteless, colored nakedness. But unlike Gibson, Cordier benefited somewhat from this new public opinion. Patina and enamel allow an infinite combination of colors. As you can imagine, this led to endless commercial opportunities for Cordier. When the African Venus and the Negro of Timbuktu were displayed in 1851, Queen Victoria purchased them both. Now, if you don't know, and there's no real reason for you to, a number of strategic PR stunts gave Queen Victoria a chokehold on the British middle class. 
publishers like the Illustrated London News defining mass media with huge circulations. And through a bit of aspirational post-colonial osmosis, she is the reason we wear white wedding dresses and bring pine trees indoors for Christmas. 1848, they printed this illustration of Albert and Victoria around their beautiful Christmas tree. The Kim Kardashian of the 19th century. So when Big Vicky got her hands on these two bronze busts, one can only imagine how Shine would respond. Everything I do, bitches wanna do it too. I guess, guess you just give to my low. Despite expectations, Cordier was not above treating his works as pure decoration. Both the African Venus and Said Abdullah were made into a clock and barometer, respectively. Among his clients, Russian Prince Demidov, Baron James the Rothschild, Emperor Napoleon III, and Empress Eugenie. Even Napoleon III was unable to resist the trend in collecting colonial subjects. After the Salon of 1857, he purchased a Caucasian and Negro type, the aforementioned Arab of Lagois, and Negro of the Sudan. For such lavish commissions, Cordier created models that could be varied with different stones and colors. You have the bronze head, the head and the bust in bronze, bronze head with some onyx, bronze head with more onyx, and you have the grand piece, very decorative, totally engulfed in onyx marble. This mix and match, build the bust workshop approach to making art threatened the singularity of the art object. The object is really three in one. And aligned it more with the spirit of mass production. The bronze head has been inserted into the marble torso and the marble turban is removable. Mass production, which by 1851 became a prime focus of Second Empire France. At Paris's 1867 Universal Exhibition, Cordier was billed as ethnographic and decorative sculptor. But it was not in the sculpture section of the exposition, it was in the section dedicated to, to luxury furniture. Featured in the Furniture and Household Objects, Luxury Furniture, and Fine Arts sections, his works appeared alongside credenzas, candelabras, busts, mantelpieces, and torches. Quarries, which had been previously used by the Romans, had been rediscovered in 1848. The illustrated guide to the exposition emphasized a link between the Roman Empire and the modern French Empire via the recently rediscovered quarry in Oran. Cordier understood rapidly the use he could make of this beautiful material. We've already discussed Cordier's habit of sculpting ethnic busts using materials from their respective regions. Here, the Kabyle boy is made of filfila marble. He made use of Algerian white marble to sculpt his Kabylie child. While the Kabylies are an actual ethnic group, they were considered then a mythological race of Caucasians who lived separately in the Algerian mountains, preserving their noble caucasity like a race of lost Atlanteans. Impossible, I know black. Cordier's busts, with their racial classifications, functioned as a spectacle of racial typologies. Fitting a richer clientele attracted by the representation of distant peoples. As display objects in a Second Empire home, they fit into a larger strategy of colonial consumption. Combining his busts with their natural resources, Cordier created concrete objects of possession. Onyx marble was used for vases, planters, and products of refinement. But the most extravagant example is the bathtub of a famous courtesan, La Paiva. Perhaps nothing demonstrates this more than his torchères, in which the figure of a woman, sometimes Arab, sometimes Indian, carries a vessel overhead. A vessel which served as a torch lamp that, unlike other fine art objects, had a distinct non-aesthetic utility. Look familiar? In our last video, we discussed how white sculpture was a smokescreen that enabled sculptors to contain their fascination with alluring and sometimes disturbing subjects. Sort of telling us, you know, if you let these beautiful women get out of control, the world is going to suffer. As white marble was used to turn offensive nakedness into acceptable nudity, these decorative interiors turned colonial violence into high-class luxury. One way to absorb them and control them is through fantasy. Barbara Larson claims that Cordier's busts, like colonial photography, are forms of visual anthropology with strategies of Western intervention. When people are in a state of objection, they pose no real threat and can be inscribed with a romantic nobility. The focus can be on beauty, which obfuscates the unpleasant aspects of imperial control. And through mythologies. Like the Blackamoor statues and the Testa di Moro. Johann Winkelmann, who's often considered to be almost the founder of art history as a discipline, liked his sculpture white and pure. So let's bring it all together. Jarvis and his ilk find polychrome sculptures ugly. They could have just said that and been done, but that's not what happened. Materially, mixing marble didn't conform to the pure uniformity of true sculpture, though the specific mixing highlighted the color of the skin. Playing with the color of the flesh, the color of the clothes. Technically, they depended too much on novelty. The top rail 
of the Paris Opera was in onyx marble. Although in some cases the novelty was that of Algerian marble. And so from this grand Parisian place, you jump to the middle of Algeria. <laughs> Symbolically, they appealed outside the realm of pure aesthetics, but that symbolic appeal was to race science. Black bodies were often purposefully associated with simians rather than white statues. Industrially, it was too mass cultural. That mass cultural effect, however, was bringing Moors into the home. If you come into my house, don't fuck my wife. <laughs> At every point of seemingly reasonable criticism, there's something ethnic afoot. But lo, you say, all this talk of ruddy to blacko, to blacko, <laughs> not to, not to blacko. All this talk of ruddy, tobacco-stained blackamoors is just circumstantial. Oh, I love what you do, man, but... A bunch of very convincing, pure conjecture about Olympian skulls. Must everything be race? How did anyone at the time claim that white marble was racial? In fact, Winkelmann wrote, the whiter the body is, the more beautiful it is. I'm so glad you asked. Yes, everything. <laughs> A white dude, his name was Johnny. And Johnny, he was a thousand. Uh -huh. Puerto Rican Bobby used to be a deacon. And this black dude, I call King Kong, he had a big ex. In statuary, the strategic use of whiteness was paramount in the acceptance of the nude. Nude slave women in sculpture and decorative arts were accepted. One critic, when he encountered a statue privately, was so overcome, so overwhelmed, so compelled by the abstract moral joy, he confessed his desire to kiss it. And here I was thinking the only pleasure of marble was intellectual. Labeling the nakedness of polychrome sculptures perverse is what enabled this tasteful intellectual pleasure. Now this makes sense with Tinted Venus, but Cordier didn't work in nudes. This insistence on non-colored neutrality had other implications. Namely, according to Nelson, the obliteration slash containment of visual racial difference. Instead, it functioned as a supposedly universal abstraction of the biological reality of all white skin, which absented the possibility of racial difference, making the black subject more palatable to a dominantly white viewing audience. For if black bodies were cloaked in white marble, then the most obvious and arguably primary signifier of race, skin color, complexion, was obliterated and contained. For neoclassicism, whiteness was a universal category, an abstraction that made the sensual moral. However, Edward Hale, sometime advocate for Dented Venus, argues against this. He believed that the abstract pleasure of sculpture was not the reason for the primacy of whiteness. He asks rhetorically, the real question then is this, if next week in some new quarry at Cerevetsa or in Rutland, a vein of marble more flesh-like in color should be found than any used today, would not every artist gladly use it in his busts of living men and women? Now I am but a mere child of hand, and have not inspected the skin of every white person, but I have seen clouds. In my experience, most white people have a look more cream of calcium carbonate than cumulonimbus. But his argument is that white marble is ideal because it most closely resembled human flesh. He continues, if not, why do we not work in black marble or green? We work in white because it is the nearest approach we have to the color of human flesh. Girl. <laughs> Now clearly, there's some rhetorical overloading going on. Obviously, people did work in black marble. It's damn near all they did at Fontainebleau. There were well-known polychrome Roman sculptures which artists knew about. But he advocates for white as the color of human skin, disavowing racial difference. And I'm struggling to understand, in a world obsessively developing racial categories, actively expanding colonial holdings, and fat off the fruit of slavery, how such an opinion is sustained. And when reading this whiteness racially, the inconsistencies just keep coming. Even Jarvis, a man famously against mixing media, departs from his argument for white abstraction. He almost advocates realism when extolling the virtues of female beauty. It is, however, a very particular female beauty with very particular material consequences. It is white. Am I about to carry? I'm gonna carry a little bit. Female loveliness is the most fascinating type of humanity. No hue of the animal or vegetable kingdom rivals the tints with which the charms of women glow. The art that can make us feel the smoothness and elasticity of the female skin. Its clear, translucent surface, not lustrous, but tender from its delicate mingling of white and pale warm red, subdued by the nicest gradations of the purest and most pearly grays into sense captivating loveliness is scarcely of earthly mold. That was really extra. I'm feeling my oats.
This again was the man who raged against the perversion of polychrome. Can you tap that white girl for me? After detailing the very tactile, very fleshy merits of white marble. My milk of magnesia. He saves himself, invoking the spiritual. After the devil made you, he broke the mold. Scarcely of earthly mold. Okay, girl, we see right through this. This man's breeches are fully creamed. Oh, shit! What Jarvis finds most beautiful in the female form consists in part of the particular effects of porcelain looking skin. It is not to say that he holds any particular disdain for black skin. It is heavily implied. Oh! While it is heavily implied, it is to give some context to his horror for the freakish sculptures of Blackamoors. What the white marble of 19th century neoclassical sculpture really suppressed was the possibility of the representation of the black body, which registered racial color difference at the level of the skin. So yes, the whiteness of marble was racial, and that whiteness is working on many levels. Positively, it established a purity of aesthetic experience, unbothered by the reflection of a real body, or a black one. Intellectual beauty. It maintained a purity of cultural production, untouched by scientific or industrial endeavor, like the science of human variation. How many races would there be? But inversely, it served to insulate. To insulate marble from sexual suggestion. They seem very erotic. To insulate the art object from racial difference. And what does that mean? And if the threat of sex and the threat of race so gravely concerned these critics, imagine their horror when the two came together. And imagine they did. And that real white man knows I'm telling the truth. He knows. That's why he likes to look at his family tree. Just look at it. Because if he shakes it, a nigga will fall out. There's also an interest in what's happening in North Africa and the Middle East, and it's a phenomenon we call Orientalism. Do you love me? So you have myths of this Oriental woman, myths of enslaved women and American slaves. And it turns up in literature, it turns up in plays, it turns up in opera, it turns up in art. Cordier worked within a broader aesthetic context that had a unique way of dealing with indecent, shame-inducing images. The Victorians were one of the most anxious groups of people. Sinful pictures were made manageable by distancing them either in time or space. And it was important for the nude to be distanced. Nudes were acceptable if set in a long ago pre-Christian time. Eve, Cleopatra, the death of Sardanapalus. In other words, not a contemporary nude figure, but distanced by time, that classical figure. Nudes were alternately acceptable if they represented faraway, non-Christian peoples. This figure, however, is distanced by geography. The innocence of the past gave us neoclassicism. That classical figure. And the fetish for the foreign gave us orientalism. So in the absence of photography, paintings like this were seen as a kind of documentation, even though we understand it as a construction of the desires of the French public. See Hiram Powers justify the nakedness of his tempted Eve. It is a difficult thing to find a subject of modern times whose history and peculiarities will justify entire nudity. In the case of my Eve, clothing would be preposterous, for she was conscious she was naked only after she had fallen. On the Orientalist front was a trend in sexually suggestive harem paintings. This is Delacroix's The Women of Algiers in their apartment. We're looking at the inside of a harem. Depicting ladies always lounging, always lusty, somewhere in the Middle East. A place of indulgence, a place of luxury. A place of leisure. A more modest example is La Grande Oralisque by Jean-Auguste Dominique Ingres. It's spelled Ingres, so get into that. This is a painting that really is a tease. Now, Odalisque. Odalisque simply means a woman in a harem. But the Western conception more or less translates to sex slave. There's a whole conversation about how the word Slav relates to the word slave. It's not an accident, but that's not this video. But get into it. In the painting, a woman with an impossibly long back glances knowingly over her snowy shoulder, dangling a peacock feather fan, surrounded by all the decadence a Frenchman can imagine. This lush environment, embroidered satins and silks and jewels and pearls. Or Jean-Léon Jerome's pool in a harem, where a swarthy man, swaddled from head to toe, interacts with two lesser dressed, lesser complected women. One of them posed in an oddly familiar position. 
We often see black figures in European paintings from this time to set off what the French saw as the greater beauty of the lighter skinned figures. In the Orientalist tradition, there was also a prevalence of images of women sold into slavery, often depicted in compromising positions. In Jerome's 1867 The Slave Market, a woman is indiscreetly inspected by a potential buyer, checking her teeth. He manually penetrates her mouth. The viewer sees everything else. The painting almost invites you to imagine what happens next. History and nature both require nudity. The slave is compelled to stand naked to be judged in the slave market. This is a historical fact. Few subjects, however, can be found. In the world of sculpture, Jean-Jacques Poitier's nude, white, turbaned odalisque is worth mentioning. This nude bears a striking resemblance to the figures in Anga's Turkish bath. She holds a peacock feather fan plucked right out of the odalisque. You can see in these repeated tropes and contorted poses, something like setting a standard for a beautiful image. I've never seen anyone so, so perfect. A beauty standard achievable only with three extra vertebrae. In fact, her body seems impossible. Her back is simply too long as if there are extra vertebrae. Call it the Saracen spine lift. What's the perfect human without a perfect bootay? Displayed at that same 1851 exhibition was the American sculptor Hiram Powers' Greek slave. This statue, depicting a captive woman, captured in gleaming white marble, gripping a crucifix and demurely avoiding the gaze of her likely Ottoman master. This sculpture was one of his most successful works and will be the subject of another video. Why enslaved women became such a popular subject so, what's the significance of all these white women being snatched up by Muslims? We wouldn't want anything to happen to our favorite potential beauty queen. Helicopter, helicopter. Orientalism conceived of the Orient as a place stuck in the past. Where time stood still. Grown lazy and decadent with the luxury of its former glory a kind of laziness or seen as exotic. As opposed to the rapidly developing capitalist scientific civilizations of Europe. This was a culture to the French that didn't progress the way things did in Europe. The Orient is an ambiguous category, floating sometimes between the Near East, the Muslim world, and the Far East, depending on who you ask. Orientalism, in its narrowest sense, refers to a European or Anglo-American view of North Africa, perhaps the Middle or Near East. It's important to know that Greece had only recently gained independence from the Ottomans. Which is to say that for about four centuries prior, the fatherland of democracy, the crucible of Europe, the origin of antiquity, lay under Ottoman rule. Exotic and slightly dangerous. And Hiram Powers explicitly dedicates this sculpture to the Greek War of Independence. Like 1831, the, the date might be wrong, but this is an American sculptor sculpting anti-slavery statues before the Civil War. The irony was lost on no one, save the artist himself. But again, another video. So if you put one of those outside of your house, what are you saying? Like the Teste di Moro before, this sculpture was an image of an interracial invasion. If you come into my house, don't fuck my wife. <laughs> now recall Cordier's comments on his mulatto woman of Algiers, the one whose forehead revealed the profound reckoning of despotic passions. Well, now you know whose despotic passions were being referred to. Do you love me? One wonders, along with her otherwise intelligent forehead, if her face featured a cheek structure predominantly Native American and Middle Eastern. Very sharp, fuller cheekbones. Everywhere you look, the patina of fine art containing and facilitating certain visual sins. Cuck comes from the word cuckold. By definition, a cuckold is a guy whose wife cheats on him. You want tits and ass? Put them in the past. You want to see bare breasts? Ensure a nearby more. Just make sure she looks like she's in some Arab place. Over time, getting cheated on became a fetish. But the thing with all this rerouting and disavowing is that sometimes you get your wires crossed. And naturally, it's led to a substantial amount of interracial cuckold porn. White husband watches his wife get rammed by a large black man. The odalisques and the slave market paintings are two parts of the same process. On the one hand, you have innocent, recalcitrant white women abducted. On the other, willing, seductive, corrupted women with inviting gazes. But inviting who? My milk of magnesia. Pradier's white female subject, who, although mediated by racial corruption, posed problems with the heightened physicality and intimate viewing relationships of three-dimensional sculpture. So it would seem that one way to acceptably view a female nude was pure white in the past. 
Alternately, through the eyes of a savage man who holds your woman against her will, or worse, willingly. Well, maybe you and I could uh, make a little jungle fever. Cartier offered yet another moment in the sexual narrative. The woman, in this instance, was already in the harem, already given over to the interracial sexual contact. Are we witness to the titillating moments before miscegenating sex? This is what makes it interesting. I've emphasized ad nauseum that the innocence of white sculpture was secured by claiming polygamy was too obscene. In a similar way, white marble worked its magic on a multitude of racial anxieties. Anxieties that were triggered in part by Cordier's depictions of mulattoes, Moors, and Algerians. Anxieties that were fully articulated in the popular arts. TJ, I'm here today to speak for all people of mixed race in America. Now, as a black Latino woman, I believe we deserve our own race category. I'm of mixed race, and I've struggled my whole life as to whether I'm Chinese, whether I'm black. But you know what Chinese it does not matter? What you are is Chinese-gro. Chinese-gro. Chinese-gro, there you go. Having already been denied fine arts pearl-clutching respectability. I love what you do, man, but you make me feel so guilty. The popular arts dove head first into these contradictions. It's too bad. I say nigga a hundred times every morning. It makes my teeth white. <laughs> See Thomas Rowlandson's A Merry Milkmaid, in which the eponymous milkmaid gleefully receives a dark member into her milky munch. Hey, baby, you want me? Or his more opulent harem, wherein a man in a turban sits very erect, deciding which of his eager white acolytes he will have for his pleasure. Well, you can get this lab here for free. This tasteless, shameless, incredibly humorous display of the colonial encounter was parodied in the popular arts. What the hell is Chinese girl? But it was always present. This is a painting that really is a tease. Note that Cordier's task in sculpting pure racial types Chinese eyes, Indian hair, black girl was itself based on a fear of race mixing. You can see this concern even in anthropological circles, particularly in race scientist Johann Friedman Blumenbach's description of Negro genitalia. It is generally believed that in Negroes, the virile member is black. The one I have in my anatomical cabinet conforms to such an opinion, but I do not know if this particularity is constant or exclusive to my sample. Some say that ardent women prefer the caress of Negroes. For their part, European men often desire women of color. I do not pretend to know the causes behind such preferences. They are, perhaps, numerous. What we can see in the illogical, infertile fear of race mixing, in the proliferation of Orientalist imagery, and yes, even in the war against material polychromy, is not only an attempt to keep things pure, but also, of course, to keep them white. The skin on her arms and hands, it's all sorts of different colors. What I've tried to establish is that a whirlwind of social, scientific, and aesthetic forces produced a unique investment in a specific kind of sculpture. We should engage these works with questions, not just accept them. And if so many forces can converge on a certain kind of sculpture, what forces can account for an ill-fated photo shoot somewhere in Greece? It's, it's what people die for. The forces, to borrow a phrase, they are perhaps numerous because beauty can be deceptive. And if 200-year-old sculptures can't explain Instagram face, they can help us answer, how does one beautifully sculpt a black woman under the enforced obedience of European influence? And with that, next time, we'll look at Mary Ammonia Lewis, a black and native expat who went to Rome to study sculpture in the 19th century. Now I must confess, this is the excellent foffery of the world. That video should have come out last February. But it turns out the work that I thought I had to do is much harder than the work that had to be done. So if you want to support me in this work and make that shit go faster, you could, you know, donate to my Patreon, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you know, again, any institutions, I know somebody got the Museum Connect. So, you know, you could share a link. You know, <laughs> get into it. Tearing their undersides open and rending and eating their flesh.